yields are mostly negative or zero, keep liquid cash, then some of it I will convert into gold and silver. Whenever the crisis speaks again, then people will buy silver. If you still don't have any as an insurance for catastrophe, not for slowdown, but for something bigger, then you should get some. Please join us for our next live stream this Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll go over current events, past guest views, and of course, gold and silver. Once again, please join us this Monday night, August 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern. See you there. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe, click on the bell to be notified on new updates, and do give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we appreciate your support. A return guest joins us today on SBTV, Lior Gantz, who is the founder of Wealth Research Group, a platform where Lior shares content that allows readers to approach investing with methodical precision and a well-thought-out game plan. And we are delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Lior, and welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Good, Patrick. Thanks for having me back. Great. Glad you can be here. Um, I, I read a recent article on your website and you graciously shared a bit about yourself, your growing up years and how as a teen you uh, coached basketball to first graders. You did some babysitting, you painted some decks and distributed flyers mm -hmm. to save seed capital to build up what you call your financial fortress. And I like that name, financial fortress. Can you Share with us a little more about those years and what got you interested in investing. Sure. Um, what happened, unfortunately, in my family is that um, my father was a was a businessman, and um, one of his businesses went down, uh, went under when I was uh, 13 years old. So 1997, and um, I find myself in a situation where I'm 13. I'm, I'm just starting to have. My own desires, right? You want to go out, you want to do this and that. And uh, he can't afford to give me uh, $10, $20 to do stuff. So <clears throat> um, kind of intuitively, I said, okay, well, I, I need to make some money. So uh, at the end of my street, there was a basketball court where uh, the, the afternoon uh, practices happened. And since I was playing basketball myself um, at, at a team, I approached the coach. He knew me, um, you know, uh, from from uh, playing for him when I was uh, just a first grader. And I told him, "How about I uh, I uh, help you uh, coach here?" So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And then all these parents said, "Well, th do you babysit uh, these kids that you're coaching? Can you babysit?" And then that started happening, um, and that grew. So I, I hired, I sub hired uh, other friends of mine to do some babysitting when I couldn't. And uh, by the time I was uh, 16, I um, basically developed uh, a little uh, savings account with about 20 grand worth of today's money, um, U.S. And what happened is um, the banker said, you should invest this money. It's just sitting there in your, uh, in your account. Invest it. But as a 16-year-old, your parents have to do the investing for you, and I didn't want to do that. So he told me, uh, why don't you have a, uh, the parent, one of the parents sign a waiver so you can trade as a minor. And that's what I did. My grandfather uh, gave me two books, one from Buffett uh, and one from Peter Lynch. And uh, those got me started, basically. Buffett's book was all about, listen, you have to find businesses that are easy for you to understand and focus on brands. And... Um, Peter Lynch's book is filled with uh, situations where his teenage daughter gave him big winners. And so I'm thinking to myself, this guy has been the best performing uh, fund manager of the 1980s. His teenage daughter gave him um, some of his best picks. Buffett tells you to go with brands. By that time, I was, uh, um, I was a, um, a, a salesman at a, at a clothing shop. So at 16, so I knew a lot of apparel brands. So I Googled the, the you know the number one apparel manufacturer in the world. It's B VF Corp. Uh, it still exists till today. It's a holding company for Timberland and John Sport and Lee and Wrangler and wow. many uh, 
brands that everybody knows, uh, but like the holding company is unknown. And I that was the first investment I made. I took half of that money and put it there in, in June of 2000. And the stock is up uh, 18 times in price since then. And the dividend is up 800%, so eight, eight times the income. Still holding it uh, until today. At some point, um, one of my friends say, you know, there's a lot of correlation between where interest rates are and what stocks are doing. And that's where it started to, um, uh, that's where I started to look at it. And uh, being a very avid book reader, started reading a lot of books about the Federal Reserve and watching many documentaries. And, and that's basically how it started. But it was about 2007. And then uh, 2008 came along and, and um, it was a good, uh, lucky again, in terms of uh, a good time to learn about precious metals just a year before they started a, a, a big uh, three-year rally. Yeah, well, it sounds like you had a great bunch of friends. But um, what was the, the greatest challenge you had to overcome personally as you learned about investing? Um, I think the, the, the way to implement what you learn. So when you study things in theory, uh, it's, it's, you, know, you, you know that it's true consciously. But to uh, make sure that the subconscious mind, in other words, your habits, are as good as your conscious thinking, uh, you know, Buffett always says, look, you know, be greedy when uh, other people are, are fearful, et cetera, and do the and 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 uh, be be fearful if if there's euphoria. But when that actually happens, your subconscious mind is usually looking to capitalize on the greed and say, oh my God, th these things are going up. I need to uh, be part of it. So implementing and habitualizing the, the strategies, the principles, because they're all there. Um, the, uh, you know, when Buffett started, for example, a lot of the information, getting, an inf getting information, Patrick, was the main deal. Like if you can find a company that's doing well, and and being an early investor, that was a big deal. Today, there's literally uh, no way that you can find out something that most other people do not know. That is the reason why Buffett is not able to, to outperform the S&P 500. It's because he cannot find businesses that he doesn't have competitors bidding for them as well. When he found Geico, he actually went to the offices Saturday morning. It's a real story. Janitor opens the door, tells him, sir, this, uh, we're closed today, but you know what? The CEO happens to work here this week and wants you to climb you know, to, his, to his floor and meet with him. That's how Buffett purchased um, Geico. Uh, initially, he purchased a, a, a sum, and then 20 years later, he bought the entire company. This usually does not happen in, yeah. in today's world. And so, you know, getting information today is not the problem. Implementing information is mostly the difference between successful people and people that are chasing for success. And I think um, what I'm trying to do with the newsletter is make sure that you um, get enough published information so that you habitualize a lot of key things uh, that you need to know. Yeah, I think um, at that time you mentioned you were reading uh, three hours a day. You were, you were reading your, your books. But, um, sure. You touched on gold and silver. In okay. your your opinion, are gold and silver cash flowing assets? And if they aren't, why would we still want to buy them? Traditionally, gold and silver do not pay any yield. Um, so it's uh, but but many stocks, including Berkshire Hathaway for uh, Warren Buffett, do not pay any yield. Um, the difference being that Berkshire Hathaway is a company; it grows. In, in other words, it's worth more and more. And therefore, you can just sell a little bit every year and pay yourself out a dividend that way, right? So it does create a yield in, in, in the, in, uh, it, because it grows. In other words, it, it grows. It becomes more valuable. You can take some profits every year and keep your original position size that way. Gold and silver are not the same. Gold and silver are fixed metals. An ounce of gold is always going to be an ounce of gold. But... Compared to other cash alternatives, it fluctuates in its uh, relative value. In other words, 
when uh, in, in the fiat currency era, uh, in the last 49 years, 48 years, the price of gold fluctuates as compared to alternatives to gold, either fiat currencies or mostly government bonds. And if there's a lack of um, yield out there in the markets, uh, if, if yields are mostly negative or zero, gold, gold becomes much more attractive because it has properties that national fiat currencies do not have. It does not bear any risk of central bank manipulations, uh, you know, either uh, to, to the upside or to the downside. It's not connected to any single government or taxation system. Um, and, and then, obviously, it is proven in the, in the matter of, uh, of about 5,000 years or whatever uh, you want to call that in terms of uh, uh, staying relatively stable. So you've got that. Uh, there, are, there are mining companies or royalty companies that I absolutely love that do pay a dividend. And our companies, just like uh, Berkshire Hathaway is a company, and they can grow as well. So I much rather um, own, as not as 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 a um, as a way to hedge against cash, but as a way to earn money uh, uh, as compared to other speculations. I much rather own royalty companies. But if we're talking about my savings, I much rather own gold and silver at particular times than fiat currencies. In other words, I make the distinction between um, if I have such and such in savings that I do not want to invest, I just want to keep liquid cash, then some of it I will convert into gold and silver, uh, either in physical form or ETFs, etc. And then with regards to my speculative portfolio, which, which takes about 15% of my overall stocks portfolio, uh, which takes about 70% of my overall net worth because there's some in cash, there's some in uh, real estate, etc. That part I devote to either cannabis companies or tech companies or biotech companies or precious metals mining companies. And in that subgroup, I love uh, companies like Franco Nevada or Royal Gold, which I've uh, invested in for about eight years. They're up better than the S&P 500. In fact, Royal Gold is the best performing stock uh, in the markets in the past 28 years. Better than Apple. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's it's different than a mining company. It's not cyclical um, because it doesn't fluctuate with the price of gold and stuff. So, Patrick, to, to kind of recap what I'm saying, if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash rally and wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash ratio, uh, you can really in those, uh, uh, you know, if you go, you'll see two special reports that I created for, for this show in uh, in you know, to talk about precious metals. But then if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash gold playbook, you can really see uh, my analysis about royalty companies as compared to mining companies, etc., cetera, um, which I think is very important because yeah. it's two different investment strategies um, and you own them for various uh, reasons, not for the same reasons. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll touch on that a bit, but, um, it's also interesting that the uh, the title of a recent article of yours was uh, "Light Up the Cuban Silver Enters the the Promised Land." Had a little yeah. bit of a rough day today at the at the beginning, but um, why are you certain that it's time to light up the Cuban with regards to silver? So there are a few things that are important with silver. One is in 2019, out of 38 major assets. Uh, in the first half of the year, 37 were up. Silver was the only major asset out of the 38 uh, major assets that, that I've watched that was down. It was down 2%. Yeah. So there's one thing that is important, and that is that silver cannot trade in such a manner for an extended period of time. So when I called at the at, at the uh, 30th of, of uh, June, when I said, look, this is a great time to invest in silver at $14 or, or yeah. just over 14 it started rallying just a few days after. At mid-June, before that, uh, we talked about the fact that gold to silver was about 95 right. and that algorithms are probably waiting for it to hit 100 to 1 before they start really picking it up. 
But if, if you do that before the algorithms do, it's really not that big of a deal. So we started accumulating on the 14th of June. If you go, if you look at the website, you'll see that I started calling for um, buying a lot of uh, precious metals. And by the way, Frank of Nevada, Royal Gold, and Sprott Inc. Both the three of those uh, mining companies, I called on the 14th of June. They're all trading at all-time highs. They're all up. As we're doing this interview on August 1st, they're all up on average 21% in a month and a half. So that's huge. Um, and so that that is two things in the short term that I liked about silver. Longer term, I think silver, if you uh, research the top 30 commodities in the world, Patrick, silver is the only one that is so far removed from its all-time high. That is, that is one thing. Secondly, it is the only major commodity that had its all-time high almost 39 years ago, in 1980. So that's a big deal. It did brush uh, next to it in 2011, but didn't uh, really touch it or break it. Right. So those are two main things. Third is the fact that it, we just went through a real bear market with it. It went from 48 or 49 to about 13 at the bottom. So it's it's down substantially um, in, in terms of that. It, it trades right around its mining cost, so it doesn't have any premium attached to it. And that is uh, something that uh, is important to understand. Precious metals do get uh, premium because they act as money. That's another key component, so no premium on it. And then lastly, uh, so we went over this, the, the gold-silver ratio, um, the, the fact that it's, it's unique among commodities. And then lastly is the fact that we're entering this sort of an easing cycle. But not only that, we're entering it with markets at all-time highs. And with that, uh, it's, it's important to remember that from here, the upside for stocks is quite limited. Um, you will not see it. Uh, you will not see the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, or the Dow go up as much as they did in the last 10 years, in the coming 10 years. So the incentive to own um, equities, U.S. equities, is diminished. And when when that happens, there's usually more incentive to own commodities, uh, and silver being one of the cheapest and most discounted commodities, um, it, it makes sense. It might not be the bottom, and it might be dead money for a while, for another six to eight to ten months or whatever. But remember, with silver, you do not invest more than um, two or three percent of your portfolio. Uh, there's literally no reason to put any more than that uh, into any one commodity, let alone silver, which is very, very volatile. Okay, so between gold and silver for you personally, which which do you prefer? Um, I have a, about a ratio of 70% gold and 30% silver at all times. Okay. So um, if, if silver is, you know, if, if silver is, is as is right now, um, you know, very depressed, if I really like it, then I put a lot of money into First, first Majestic uh, Silver, which is the purest silver miner in, uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I love the CEO, founder, Keith Newmeyer, a personal friend of mine. And uh, you know what? It's up 55% in the, in the past 50 days. And uh, you know, what can you say more? Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, we've been talking a little bit about silver, but just, just for clarity, are we talking physical bullion or are we talking ETFs or, as you said, silver mining stocks? So in my case, what I did was I took two years worth of my burning burn, uh, my cash burn rate as a family unit. Let's say the family, you know, me, my wife, and, and, and everyone I support, my child, etc. Let's say we spend five thousand dollars a month on all of our expenses times twenty-four months. That's one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So in that hypothetical scenario, I took seventy percent of that, which is, which is eighty-four grand, converted into physical gold, and took the rest and convert it into physical silver. Mm -hmm. And then that's my insurance position. That is uh, something I, I don't touch. On top of that, if I wish to speculate in gold, silver, or, or uh, the ETFs, the leverage ETFs, if I wish to short it, um, if I wish to go long through the royalty companies or the miners or the exploration companies, that's part of that 15% speculative portfolio that's part of my um, uh, stocks portfolio and, and we do 
we do publish that information on the newsletter. So whatever I do, if I if I feel it's high conviction, um, I, I do publish that on, on the newsletter. Okay. Um, silver mining stocks are are they a derivative of sorts of, of silver where investors are really banking on the capability of, of management, the management team, I should say, as well as having exposure to a whole different profile of risks arising from the mining jurisdiction. Is it really different yeah. from buying the physical silver? It is. It is. It's, 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 um, it, it, look, in, in, if, if you stick with the, five to six or you know I, I can even name eight very um leveraged silver miners because silver is usually not managed uh, uh mined directly it's mined as a byproduct of zinc or lead or um uh or gold or or um copper or whatever silver mines are very rare for the few of them that are um pure plays if you stick to the to those good ones those six to eight ones they you they usually uh, do about six to eight to ten, sometimes even thirty to one on whatever the price of silver does. So yeah, definitely. Um, if you stuck to those six or eight companies, man, every time that silver rallies, take a small position in one of them, um, and and you'll make a you'll make a bundle. And unless something you know unforeseeable happens with their mine, and their mining companies, their operational mines, um, then you should do very well. There's also ETFs for, for the silver miners. So uh, you can do that and, and kind of own a basket and diversify your risk. Okay. We, we touched on the, the silver to gold ratio as well. We, we've seen it you go out from 80s into 90s. And um, I think a lot of people were, were getting worried that it was going to get into the 100 range. But in your opinion, what took silver so long this time around to start uh, moving alongside with gold? Well, gold is bought by by precious by uh, uh, central banks by the government of Russia. It's bought by you know serious institutional buyers, and silver isn't. It's waiting for your neighbor to buy some, for it to, for the price to go up. So it, it when it does, when there's real retail fear, then you saw what happens. It goes to forty eight dollars uh, an ounce in, in what in a year, from from twenty, um, and so it's such a small market. And it's a niche market. There's not a lot of interest out there for it. Uh, if and Trump, uh, Trump convinced the middle class of America that we're we're over the hurdle, and so people are not buying physical silver anymore as they did uh, in the Obama years, and certainly not when, as they did in the European crisis and all that kind of stuff. Um, whenever the crisis peaks again, then people will buy silver again. I believe it will go uh, much higher. I I can definitely see it trading for twenty two twenty three dollars an ounce. Okay, time frame. Well, <laughs> like I said, let, let's let's put it this way. Uh, I because look, the time frame is is such a you know it's a it's a bullshit prediction. the <laughs> The best way to do it is to say, look, if if there is a slowdown, a meaningful slowdown, then it will probably take less than a year. To do that, that's the best way I can say it. So you don't have to buy it now; you can wait and buy it whenever uh, you want to do. If you want it as a trade, if you still don't have any as an insurance for catastrophe, not for a slowdown, but for something bigger, right. then you should get some and right. own it and, and, and not sell. It, right? Yeah, I hear you. Um, the Fed. How do you think the the Fed's actions on uh, interest rates? How do you think it's going to impact silver prices in the, the next few weeks or months? Um, it, so it depend, depending on what happens from here, they, they just cut rates by 25 basis points. Right. If they'll need to cut rates again, then that means that um, uh, that they think the global economy is a little weaker than they originally thought. Right. That might help silver. If, if they postpone, then I think uh, silver for a while will, will not be um, as important. But I think what will happen in, in the coming decade, though, is that you'll see governments uh, starting to officially devalue their currencies in order to um, help them uh, manage their, their debt levels. And when the first one does that, I think silver, gold, um, and, and anything that is um, uh, uh, priced in, in, a, um, in a reverse correlation with the dollar yeah. will be very favorable. Okay. So you, you mentioned you have um, 
insurance silver and then you also have an investment uh, silver. How have you considered the, the onset of the next global financial crisis and how it how it's going to impact that investment silver? Um, so it, the the short answer is that if people are afraid, they usually do not own speculative assets mm -hmm. like uh, the miners and they usually sell. Now, um, in many of the big crises, the big uh, crises of the 20th century, uh, the miners were absolutely some of the best performing stocks in the market uh, and the first to rebound. So that is important to understand as well. And therefore, um, I don't think I'll be selling and opting out. And I don't think that this is a 2008 scenario. There's no leverage in the system. People do not have to sell in order to uh, answer to margin calls. Uh, for the most part, institutional money is very cashed up, and I don't see a big reason not to own um, some silver miners if there's a crisis, because I think that any crisis will be very short-lived, not in the real economy, but in the markets. Um, I think it will be short-lived because of stimulus, and I think uh, that these niche markets will rally good. Okay. Um, a lot of times we get comments um, such as uh, so-and-so said a collapse was coming. It, it's never come. A uh, broken clock is yeah. right at least yeah. twice a day. Uh, what, what, sure. How do you feel when, when you hear these things? I, I, uh, look, 2008 created a trauma in America. Yeah. And it created a whole slew of people that think, hey, there's a problem. The problem is debt. And it's all coming down tomorrow, um, and therefore it's you know it started this cult following of the, there's there's a crisis out there. There's 23, 23 and a half, 23.6, etc. Trillion dollars right. worth of debt for the, the U.S. economy, and then the, the global debt is three times GDP, etc. And it's all going to come down tomorrow. Um, it's it's not that simple, and it's not worth betting on, and it's not worth living like that. Um, Many companies are like Swiss clockwork. The, you know, the S&P 500, these companies that are in there, some mm -hmm. of them are growing at 10% a year. These are machines. These are great companies led by great management teams, etc. cetera. Um, you really have to uh, treat this as, as it comes and not make a prediction that's going to eventually put you in a box and even uh, you know, uh, make your identity part of it so that you can't even admit that you're wrong and you're, you're just not making money uh, because you're, you're doing that. Um, so I think that is important. I, I do not like to predict crises. I do not know how, I, uh, how uh, a global crisis will look like. I do know that history tells me it's better to um, have that insurance in play than not to have it, and there, therefore I have it. But... Uh, it's not the majority of my wealth and definitely not the way that I make cash flow. I, I typically ask people, what are you going to do if, if gold hits 10,000, but I'm going to switch it up. If silver hits a hundred, what is Lior going to be doing? No, uh, well, I'll, I'll sell all of it. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> You'd sell all of it. Sure. Okay. 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 Um, and, um, What's on your radar, so, right? right? Just, just, a, just a, I'm sorry, just a caveat. Uh, sure. If we're talking in, in today's dollars, not, sure. <laughs> we're not. If we're talking about, uh, so in other words, <clears throat> if today's silver, which is about 16, goes to 100, I get six times the purchasing power, and I definitely will switch it into uh, uh, cash flow real estate. Uh, if uh, we're talking about a situation where that hundred dollars is not uh, a real one hundred dollars. I'll need to weigh that situation there. Right. Um, but uh, uh, all things being equal, if silver rallies even to thirty or forty dollars in today's dollars, that is sort of the high ground for it. And, and uh, people should, if they're trading, they're uh, trading it. They should think about taking profits. What's on your, your radar right now? I mean, I know you mentioned uh, you spoke about First Majestic, you spoke about royalty companies, but, but what else is on your radar right now? Um, look, most of my portfolio is always going to be in 
a niche of companies called the Dividend Aristocrats. It's a group of fi currently 52 companies that have been able to raise their dividends year over year for tw over 25 consecutive years, but not over 50. So between 25 and 50 consecutive years. Um, and those companies are uh, you know, able to grow their earnings year over year for 25 years. That means that uh, they've been able to do it in all sorts of interest rates environments, all sorts of uh, presidencies, uh, and they are just superior companies. Usually, I have my money invested in them. They, they, um, just the ETF, a, buy, a simple buy and hold, has performed better than the S&P 500. If you know the companies uh, in them, you, you know the actual companies that uh, that are part of the 52, and you know how to measure their worth, and uh, you know you, you know how to select uh, stocks. You can even um, not only trade the ETF, but um, you know buy uh, specific ones and see how that goes for you. So that is usually where most of my um, portfolio, my uh, stocks portfolio, is is uh, tied to. Okay. And um, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about you and, of course, the, the Wealth Research Group? What can they find there? Definitely. Go to wealthresearchgroup.com and then on the, on the, top, on, on the top menu, just uh, click on the Special Reports tab. You'll see a wealth library, just uh, in, probably about 30 special reports on all sorts of information that you have to know. And great for a weekend reading and definitely enough for, for two or three months. Uh, best way to stay current with exactly what I'm doing is through uh, the newsletter, um, the Wealth Research Group newsletter. Just you, you can just subscribe on on the homepage. Okay, Lear Gans, we we thank you once again for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and um, you're in Italy, so get on going with your evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That was Lear Gans, the founder of Wealth Research Group. For more information on his work and his views on the economy, please visit his website, wealthresearchgroup.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.